Hi everybody, I'm Dan Lipton, publisher of Travel Host Beach Cities Magazine and host of The Taste of the Beach, where we showcase the best places to dine, shop, play, and stay along the beautiful coast here in Southern California. And uh, as you can see, we have a tremendous location today. I'm sitting here with uh, co-owner of Belmont Brewing Company, David Lott. Good to see you, David. Good to see you, Dan. And thanks for having us uh, today with, with some of our friends. In, in, in front of us and uh, you know I was thinking as we were uh, uh, preparing for the show today uh, this city is undergoing a tremendous transformation and dotting from downtown to the east sides you know west side and south side are all kinds of new developments and and things and sometimes you just forget that there are these mainstays like your business here that soon in the next few months, I was going to be celebrating how many years in business? 30 years. 30 years in business. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's an awesome been a good ride. testimony to uh, a successful business of any time, much less a, a, a craft brewery and, and restaurant. So um, I'm just so eager to learn about the, the, the backstory of Belmont Brewing Company. Um, so... Uh, why don't you please, you know, kind of take it away, if you don't mind, a little bit and tell us how this whole thing got started. Sure, absolutely. Well, I was in the restaurant business back in the 80s, and uh, I was uh, very interested in developing my own concept. Yeah. And uh, But there was not a concept out there that I felt comfortable mm -hmm. engaging in that was new and fresh and exciting and different. Uh, and uh, my brother happened to be living in Seattle. He moved up there. And uh, on one of my visits, I discovered this uh, beer renaissance started up in the Pacific Northwest um, with uh, these this craft brewing and uh, I've always been a beer guy it's always been my beverage of choice and uh, it, it really got my fascination going and then I, uh, I, I walked into a place uh, up in the Bay Area called Triple Rock I don't, they don't mind me uh, saying that and uh, the light bulb went off and there was a, a very creative little brew pub and I said this is what I want to do and there was nothing down in Southern California that was uh, was happening in that area mm -hmm. and uh, so I thought well if I'm gonna roll the dice and do a place myself this this is gonna be it so that was the genesis of uh, uh, Belmont Brewing and right. we were the we were the first down here we were the tip of the spear and uh, still the oldest uh, um, operating uh, brew pub in uh, LA County and uh, we, I think uh, Carl Strauss beat us about a year down in uh, San Diego area so what what was it like to even I mean was it was uh, the equipment readily available to do this and people who kind of knew what they were doing or did you guys kind of fly by the seat of your pants a little bit well I was told by a, a good business advisor he says people don't plan to fail they plan they fail to plan so I took that to heart and I planned and I planned and I planned and I took some brewing courses up at the UC Davis in their fermentation science department and there was a fellow there, Michael Lewis, who was the godfather of uh, the the uh, the beginning of the uh, um, craft brewing scene. And so uh, he took me under his wing and uh, guided me about equipment and uh, that sort of thing and processes. And and uh, so um, that was the he was a huge help. And then um, when we came to the city. Um, and proposed this idea. They didn't know what to do with us. They'd never heard of a, a yeah. brewing. And I said, well, just think of it as a, a liquid bakery because uh, it's the same ingredients as bread. And they, they all agreed that that was okay. And uh, so we didn't have any problem with permitting at the time. Right. And now, of course, uh, as you as you mentioned, there's a, a brewery on every corner. It seems like the, it. This city's really, you know, taken off on yeah. it. I know, you know, Torrance to the north of us, uh, uh, you know breweries all over the place but you are a brewery and a restaurant yeah and you ha and I'm assuming that's you, you started out that way as well yeah we started that way my background was in restaurants so I felt comfortable with the uh, the restaurant side of things and, uh, and I was doing my homework on the brewing uh, and then um, but you know when we first conceived the idea I thought we'd be maybe a, just a beer garden and food would be an afterthought after one or two weeks of operation it became very clear that people wanted food. They wanted more and more food, creative food, good food. And so we really had to retool very rapidly and start producing what people were asking for. 
Well, let's talk about this iconic location. I mean, let's not overlook where we are here. I mean, the Belmont Pier is right here. How did you come across, you know, this space? Is this a was this a build out or did you do a remodel? What? How did you come? There how was did you a luck out here? There was a developer who um, was just going to do residential units, mm -hmm. and the city uh, required him to have a restaurant tenant down here because this was actually um, considered a uh, underdeveloped area down here, and they wanted they wanted to draw more people to the pier. So they, the city figured that if there's a restaurant, that would do the trick. So uh, he was a developer looking for a tenant. We we hooked up at the just perfect timing, mm -hmm. and he liked our idea, and um, the rest is history. And then the, then the city said, you know, we'll give you a patio patio space, and you know we're going to turn that down. Sure, raise raise your hand, right? Yeah. So we're the only place on the beach in Long Beach that's got a you know so a let's, patio let's, on the beach. Let's frame the location for our viewers. Uh, we're on Ocean Boulevard, uh, right just, off Ocean. Right, just right off Ocean, uh, 39th Avenue. Place. Place, <laughs> and we're uh, just west of Belmont Shore. Correct. And this area over here is Bluff Park. I think they call that Bluff Park. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. There's so many little sub, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, neighborhoods in town. But yeah, uh, the point is, if you head toward the water, you can't go any farther because uh, you're going to get sandy here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about. I know you have a partner. An yes. Another Dave. Yes. David Hansen. David Hansen. He and, was my uh, and you go all the way college back. roommate. We right. were in graduate school at UCLA. Up. And, and, and that's a, obviously a testimony to, you know, two guys who have a, a, a common vision. Yeah. And uh, and that, that's terrific. Um, how do you describe, other than the fact that you're the original craft brewery, you've been around 30 years, how do you like to describe your menu to uh, people when they ask? Uh, our original guidelines, since we don't have a thematic... Uh, consistent theme through our food uh, it was anything that went well with beer and most things go well with beer so let's just uh, go with that um, I also wanted to create a menu in which it would be hard to make a decision everything looks good love that I go to restaurants when, and nothing looks good I know and then I go to other places everything, everything looks, looks good, good. Right. so I want to have a menu that everything looks good if something doesn't sell we take it off the menu and replace it with something that you know will. Right. And we uh, we we uh, get the staff input constantly. You know how are customers reacting to all the items? So if something is not um, reacting well, uh, we replace it or fix it. We're going to meet your uh, brewmaster in our next segment, but uh, just as a, a general rule, how many different beers are you brewing at any given time? Well, uh, he, he is hamstrung by our original uh, planning okay. and our sizing of our brewery. Uh, we, we are maxed out now, and he's doing the best he can to put out uh, six or seven of our own style beers. Um, we just don't have the tankage or the, mm -hmm. of the space to do more. Some of the more uh, recently designed breweries have a different vision where they have maybe 15, 20, 25 different beers. Uh, we just don't. Being uh, in the beginning, we didn't know what to expect. So we have what we have, and we're staying with it. Uh, and you mentioned to me that, you know, uh, there's one in particular that's very popular, a strawberry blonde. But uh, how often do you uh, rotate uh, beers? Well, we have our, our regular lineup. It's about five beers. And then we have beers of the month. We have, uh, he does, he's very creative. Uh, we have, of course, IPAs are the hot ticket that's mm -hmm. what people gravitate to um, but he's he's uh, he gets as creative as he possibly can given the size of our brewery and uh, so he'll experiment with different hops different yeasts um, do whatever he can but he's a very meticulous clean brewer which uh, which is uh, very very good absolutely we, we, know, we know how important sterilization is in, yep. in brew making uh, okay so since uh, beer goes with uh, 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 you know, almost everything, and there's some great food in front of us. Do you mind uh, describing for our viewers uh, what you've uh, brought out for us today? Sure, absolutely. Well, we can't have a restaurant on the beach without tacos, so we have uh, a tacos are a huge seller of ours. We will do them Baja style, battered, uh, and we also do them grilled for people who don't like the batter. But 
they both sell really well. Fish tacos. The fish tacos, you're right. Um, we also have a grilled avocado, which is uh, one of our very uh, iconic yeah. uh, items. Uh, we uh, grill it, warm it, and then uh, we'll put a bacon glaze on it with pico de gallo and sour cream with some toast points. So you can scoop out the warm avocado, put it on the toast point, and uh, share it with a lot of people. It looks amazing. Um, that's been a huge success. That's one of our biggest selling appetizers. Um, we have a new, uh, we used to have uh, pizzas. Pizzas took too long. We did the whole dough and, and the pizza was too thick. We found this new product. It's actually, it's a, it's a pastry. We imported it from France. And you will not find a thinner, more delectable uh, pastry or, or flatbread pizza um, anywhere. This stuff is amazing. Um, that's great. We do a number of the flatbreads with us. Uh, and then we have a pokey bowl, one of our standards. Um, um, pokey is very, you know, fish, raw fish has become very popular. Right. Um, and uh, then we have our, we've had our uh, ahi tuna pokey. Uh, that's been on the menu for a long time, big seller of ours. So that's what we have right here. Sure. And then what are some of the other things perhaps on the menu that you just want to mention that it, because uh, there was no more room at the table. Yeah. Well, we do a, a lobster bisque that is uh, one of our most popular uh, oh, soups. Yeah, I love lobster bisque. And uh, we do also do a Tuscan tomato soup with a puff pastry on top. That's also very popular, um, and um, yeah. How about a burger? Can someone get a burger here? Well, yeah, we have uh, we have a Kobe burger for people who want to, you know, go high line, high line beef, mm -hmm. and uh, and we have, uh, and we have the Chuck, regular Chuck burger, and then um, yeah, we do a Mediterranean burger with uh, a fig sauce, oh, which nice. is kind of nice. Yeah, great. And uh, you're open, right, seven days, uh, seven days. a week? And, and we do breakfast on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. We okay. open at 10. We Great. do have a kind of a hybrid menu on the weekend. We have introduced some breakfast items with regular lunch items. One of the things I love about, about this location is it almost appears as if perhaps it looks like you have more outdoor seating than you do indoor seating. I think we do. Which is terrific. Yeah. Because... Uh, uh, I know a lot of the new concepts in, in town, they're trying to figure out ways to get open air spots, whether it's garage doors or whatever, and you, uh, you, you cornered the market on... Uh, on People want to eat outdoors. Yeah, they do. Well, in a, in a, you know, when you're along the coast like we are, and they, they say the numbers are 345 out of 365 sunny, uh, that's only good for business. Yeah. In fact, sometimes it gets too sunny, too hot, we had to put all the shade material in. I want to sit outside, but not in the sun. Yeah, right. Well, for sure. So, well, thank you uh, for going over this. And we, you know, we're anxious to talk to uh, your brewmaster and uh, and uh, in, enjoy some of the delectable food that you put out. Uh, thank you for your dedication to 30 years in this business and, and you know keeping the enthusiasm and the spirit up. I know this is not an easy business. And, uh, uh, you know, we appreciate, you know, what you do here. In well, the I city feel very Beach. fortunate. I still like to come to work, you know, and yeah. that, and that, that I know from a lot of other people is, is hard to achieve. Right. And when you, when you enjoy going to work, it doesn't feel like work. That's not another four letter word. Yeah, that's right. So thanks again. Okay. Here's to the Belmont Brewing Company. We're going to take a break and, uh, and talk to Blackwell. Uh, the Belmont Brewing Company uh, brewmaster here uh, right after the break. We're uh, Dan Lipton here. We're back he here at Belmont Brewing Company, 2539th place, just off Ocean Boulevard. Beautiful Long Beach, right on right on the water. And I'm with Blackwell. Yep, the, Blackwell. That's my name. The brewmaster here. Yep. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Dan. Yeah. Cheers. And uh, what a fun atmosphere. Yeah. How long have you been here? Uh, about half an hour. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how, about the, how about the rest of your career? The rest of my career, I've been here uh, a little over 20 years. All right, so you're just yeah. kind of... Starting to figure it out. Feel, feeling the place out. Yeah, starting yeah. to figure it out. How did you get... get my recipes established, you know. How'd you get into the business? How'd, where's the, where was the passion for beer come well, from? It's just a hobby that I picked up in college. 
The only marketable skill I learned in college, really, with a political science degree, you know, how do you market that? But I can make beer. Yeah. So, so you actually just like a, like how I started home brewing with a kit or something? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I started home brewing in geez, like ninety. I mean, uh, so long ago I barely remember. Let's see. It must have been. Uh, Around 1989, 1988, 89, started home brewing, and I uh, got my first job brewing beer in December of 96, and I uh, started working here in uh, on April 1st of 1999. Yeah. You're right. Uh, uh, no joke. Right? Uh, yeah, it's no joke. No, yeah. April 1st, 1999, yeah. I started working here. This place has been open almost 30 years, so I've been the brewer here for a little over 20, so yeah. And, and uh, how did someone realize that what you were doing was viable in terms of hiring you? Like, w- w- how did the transition take place to uh, like, wow, the, well, were, I, you, were you selling any beer or you were just giving it away? As a home brewer? Yeah. How did I get my first job, in yeah. other words? I mean, I guess you make your own luck in this world. And I was, I was making beer and uh, I was selling wine for a living. Oh, okay. And... Uh, guy that owned some liquor stores in Albuquerque. I was living in Albuquerque, and the guy that owned some liquor stores uh, opened a brewery, and uh, it's kind of a long story, but I, I, I happened on the job by just knowing this guy, and happening to walk in there right when the other guy decided he didn't want to be there anymore. And just uh, So I worked there for two and a half years. This was Kelly's Brewery in Albuquerque. They're still there. Uh, they moved locations, but they're still there, and, and uh, so I worked there for two and a half years, and then uh, I moved out here for this job. So, uh, let's talk, obviously, Belmont Brewing Company. Yeah. Beer, you feature, I believe, what, a half a dozen beers at any given time? We have, uh, we have nine right now. <laughs> Woohoo! Nine! <laughs> That's pretty good for a yeah. guy with only four fermenters. Right. And uh, seven bright tanks. Yeah. So that means, you know, some of these beers are in keg. We're right, serving sure. some of these beers off keg, which means, you know, the bright tank gets low. I got to keg up the last of the beer in the bright tank and uh, get that bright tank freed up so I can clean it and fill it back up. And, you know, you can't wait till the last pint of beer comes out of your bright tank before you decide there's 400 gallons of space here and only one pint left. I better just keg that up and, and uh, clean the tank and get it filled up with the next batch so in in the creative process creative i'm not creative sorry technician okay i'm a technician then yes. in terms of deciding what beers that you're going to produce what's that what's that like with the two davids the, the decision making process was made a long time ago because we're we're very limited in the number of lines that we have and the number of beers that we can put out. The fact that I have nine beers on tap actually is a small miracle uh, for a place like this. Uh, Created by me. Small miracle created by me. But, uh, you know, when I started working here, we had five regulars and a seasonal, and we had to keep those. You know, we can't get rid of the strawberry blonde. We can't get rid of the top sale. I mean, we can't decide, oh, we're gonna make something else and take this beer off because People come in here for the top sale. That guy over there, Jorge, he's in here for the pale ale, just like me. That's why I'm here, for the pale ale. And and so I make the same beers over and over all the time. And we had, we got another tank several years ago. We, we started making uh, more seasonal beers. But at the time, when, when we opened, we didn't have IPA. What yeah. does that mean? We didn't have IPA. When I started working here in 1999, there was no IPA. Unbelievable. I mean, IPA existed as a style, but we didn't, it wasn't. uh, Didn't blow up like it has in the last 10 years, right? So on our seasonal line, I used to make Belgian beers and Hefeweizen and, you know, a lot of different styles of beer on that seasonal line. But as IPA became more and more popular, I had to start just making IPA on that line all the time. 
And so I, I make all IPAs are one-offs. They're one-off recipes, so I just make it one time and I, I don't make it again. Um, so my creativeness is like kind of like making a sandwich. You know, you go in the walking and say, what's I, what hops are available for this IPA? And you go in, and, and you write the recipe and you make it and and uh, they drink it. Oh, they, they really do. They drink it. They drink the whole, you know, 14 kegs in two weeks. Okay. And it takes two weeks to make it. So the next one has got to be right behind yeah. it, or all these people get mad at me. Which is, which is why you have a, you have a full time job. Oh yeah, at least. <laughs> right. So what? Yeah. Let's talk about what the, the the core beers are. You're drinking the pale ale. I'm drinking the pale ale. Which does, it have, my, does it have a name other than pale ale? It's Blackwell's pale ale now. The Blackwell's right? pale ale. Okay. Unofficially, okay. I'm naming it right now. Um, this is a, this is a beer that I make for me. And it's, my contract says that whatever I can't drink, we sell. Yeah, whatever I can't drink, we sell. And so uh, it's a beer that I make just the way I like beer to be, you know. And everybody has their own taste, and, you know, everybody likes certain things, but a lot, most of us all go back to the same thing, right? You go to a restaurant that you go to all the time, you, most people always order the same thing. Yeah, there's a flavor profile that it's, they prefer. That you like. Yeah, and just like our customers, the customers that come here, my wife loves the stout that you're drinking, you know, and every time she comes here, she drinks the stout. She keeps asking me, why is there pale ale on the keg fridge at her house and not stout? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I'm like, well, you can tolerate the pale ale, honey. <laughs> On the patio, I drank this, and I really enjoyed it because yeah. there's more flavor in this than a typical pale ale. Right. So. It, oh, yes. That's right. It's really hoppy. Yes. Because, and okay, I'm, so. And, and by the way, my flavor profile is not typically hoppy, but I enjoyed that. And I'm curious as to maybe why, maybe you could tell me why I enjoyed it if I don't typically like hoppy and, beer. Uh. Well, is something, is I don't some, know why you some, don't like, Well, I don't know. I yeah. think there's something about uh, a high level of hops, which typically raises the alcohol content. Well, there you go. You just hit the nail on okay. the head. Because this is what everybody is calling, and I hate to even say it, but this is what everybody is calling these days a session IPA. I've been making this beer since before anybody ever thought of that word, but this is just a dry hopped pale ale. Sorry, banged on the table and affected the microphone. No, that's fine. But uh, this is just a dry hopped pale ale. So it's a super hoppy pale ale, which is what people now call a session IPA. I don't want to call it a session IPA really because then we would sell so much that there wouldn't be enough left for me to drink. Got it. So, <laughs> so right, so, because IPAs are so popular, if we call it a pale ale... It's a marketing thing. Yes. The whole session yeah. IPA thing is a marketing thing. Right. And calling a pale ale that's dry hop the session IPA, is, it's, it's marketing. Which, hey, good for them. Okay. I mean, we don't need to market. We have one location. You know, please come here. Please come to the Belmont Brewing Company and drink my pale ale and my IPA. Uh, I have two IPAs on tap right now. But So we, we don't need to market it, make up a name for it. We started making it, we, when I started making it, I just started calling it Pale Ale. We didn't come up with a name for it. I'm not always big into coming up with names for people well, you're because, not, you know, uh, for uh, beers because I want people to understand and know what style it is. Because like this beer is called Long Beach Crude. And, you know, like people that come here and drink it all the time, maybe they go to another bar and they're like, oh, do you have a Long Beach Crude? What actually they should be asking for is a stout, right. a strong stout. So I want people to know and understand that it's a stout. And so if you call it something that isn't the name of the style, then sometimes people maybe don't know what style it is, even though they drink it every day. But I, I find, Blackwell, that people are intimidated by this beer, I think simply because of its color. Yeah. Right? They stay away from the darker beer. Perhaps they think it's too heavy. This is not. Not heavy. It's not heavy. Right. It's dry. And the even color, though it's 6.5%, but I strive for dryness in my beers. And I achieve that dryness by giving the beer a lot of oxygen. Uh, the wort, you know, the unfermented beer, a lot of oxygen, which helps the yeast to uh, kind of wake up and, and uh, make ATP and go through that whole Krebs cycle thing. And... And uh, I use a yeast nutrient that really helps the yeast 
and uh, I use a, a yeast that makes it really dry. So those three things help to dry it out. So even though it's got a lot of alcohol in it, six and a half percent, I mean, it's not a lot, but it's not a little, it's dry and uh, doesn't, doesn't have that sweetness because I made sure that the yeast ate all the sugar. And also by my fermentation process, by turning up the fermentation temperature at the end, I'm making sure that it really finishes and finishes and eats all the sugar so that the beer comes out dry. And then the stringency and the roastiness of that uh, roasted barley, the Simpsons roasted barley that I use in that, uh, it helps that, that astringency and roastiness helps to make it taste drier. So let's talk about the color for a moment. In the black, in the, in the, well, right. So right. So the <laughs> a limited amount of times that I've brewed, uh -huh. once or twice a year for five years, uh, it comes from the malt. Oh yeah, the right? color comes from the barley. The barley, That's right? right. Malt, or, malted barley. So is there chocolate uh, malt in here? Tiny amount. Okay. There's 10 pounds and seven barrels of that beer. Oh, okay, that's not so a there's lot. There's 55 pounds of roasted barley. Okay. Yeah. Is in general, I'm a one sack brewer. In this brewery, you kind of get away with, you know, a sack of crystal malt and a sack of uh, roasted barley and uh, 10 pounds of chocolate malt and the rest two row. That's that's the recipe. Well, for I can that beer. I can just tell our tell our viewers that if you haven't tried a dark beer or you're a little intimidated by it, to you know, bypass those thoughts and try this. Because and if you like coffee, yeah, I can't tell you how many times here at the bar or at a beer festival, I'll be at a beer festival, and someone comes up and they're like, I don't really know what I want, I don't really like beer that much, and the first thing I ask them is, do you like coffee? And if they say, yeah, I like coffee, I'm like, well, just try this, think of it as a nice coffee. Smell it first, it has this wonderful, roasty coffee, like, there's no coffee in it, right? but it has this wonderful, roasty, coffee-like uh, aroma, uh, and a little bit of uh, roasty like flavor in the finish that coffee lovers, even though they think they don't like beer, they like that. And I, I would say also that that uh, at six and a half percent alcohol by by volume, that that's like I think a sweet spot, meaning For it's not stout, yeah. it's not too heavy, right. right? Where you drink one and you're you need a nap, right? And it's not too low, where you know you're like I need another beer really fast, right? You know, which I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's only four and a half. Right. It's not just. It's not. It, it's not just your job. It's also a hobby and yeah. enjoyment. And yeah, and drinking beer here for me also is quality control. Yeah, I'm checking sure. it so, every day. So beside these two, you, you mentioned two other IPAs. Yeah, I have two IPAs on right now. Okay. What, what what's different about them? Uh, well, they're both one-off batches, and. Uh, Meaning, once, meaning, it, meaning they're not uh, I make it one staples. time, I don't make it again. Yeah. And and so, well, one I made about three or four weeks ago because it's almost gone, so I can barely remember what's in it. Uh, it's like 6.8%, and it's got mosaic and, uh, and citra hops, I think. And uh, the, one that it, the one that we just put on today, uh, uh, batch number 1919, is uh, has mosaic and Simcoe and Citra and uh, uh, Centennial, and it's just a little bit stronger at seven seven point one percent. How do you shop for hops? Uh, unfortunately, that... unfortunately, you shop for hops five years in advance. Yeah, unfortunately, you have to contract for hops five years in advance. And so for us, since like I said earlier, I make the same beers over and over. So I kind of know what I'm going to make. So I know what hops I'm going to need. So I can contract out. I can contract out for them four or five years in advance and make sure that I'm going to get them. So I can continue to make the same beers over and over. And where do they, where do they typically come from? In the Black Pacific Black. Northwest. Yeah, the Pacific Northwest. You know, Washington, Oregon. And, and uh, what are your? Uh, you mentioned a strawberry blonde. Yes. Not, not a young lady, but a beer. Yes. Okay, and it's a popular beer here. It's an right? incredibly popular beer. So it's just our it's our lightest beer with a little bit of strawberry flavor in it. And it's been a staple here for well, close to thirty years. Almost since we've been open. I'm not sure exactly when they started making it, but twenty years ago when, when I started working here, it was definitely here and it was definitely already super popular. But super what I popular. what I noticed Blackwell is um, and correct me if I'm wrong. That uh, fruity type beers 
are becoming more popular. They are becoming more and more popular, yes. And that one's always been popular here. Our customers have noted, and our customers are trendsetters, as you might have noticed by just looking at these wonderful people here. Yeah, they're trendsetters, and they knew this. They knew that this uh, fruity beer thing was a good thing a long time ago. Right. Yeah. Do you, uh, when you experiment with the seasonal beer, have you made? Sours, Rattlers, anything like that? No, I just keep making IPA over and over because there's like 15 or 20 people in the room here that would be kind of mad if I didn't have one. So, we're cooking malted barley. And the, when you cook the barley with hot water at about 150 degrees, the starches in the barley convert to sugar. It's an enzymatic process. It's a natural process and so you know yeast eats sugar you know uh, so we're trying to make sugar for the yeast to eat because uh, the yeast is going to eat the sugar and make alcohol and carbohydrate ca carbon dioxide and esters and aldehydes and phenols and all that stuff that makes beer taste good chemistry a little bit of chemistry so we, we cook the barley in the mash tun and we throw 550 pounds in that little tiny mash tun and we're cooking it on top of a screen. I, I make five pounds, he makes 550 pounds. Okay. So uh, we cook it on top of a screen. So after an hour or so of, you know, stirring with a wooden paddle, I don't think you can see the wooden paddle over there, but after an hour of stirring and, and cooking, uh, the starches convert to sugar. And then we, since we're cooking it on top of a screen, just like, kind of like when you're making coffee, you rinse the sugar just like you rinse through the coffee filter, you know, you rinse the sugar off and all the sugar water, you can see that pipe back there, it open the valve back there and the sugar water goes from underneath the screen over to the kettle. So we keep putting hot water on top of that grain that's on top of that screen and keep rinsing the sugar off. So that's called sparging. So we rinse all the sugar off of the barley and we collect all that sugar water in the kettle boil that for an hour with some hops different hops for different styles of course you know more hops for an IPA less hops for a blonde ale uh, or a stout and then after the hour of boiling we're ready to put it in one of these fermenters with some yeast so the yeast can eat the sugar but we have to of course as you know cool it down first right so we have a heat exchanger to cool it down works kind of like the radiator in your car do you add corn syrup to your uh no beers? i've never added corn syrup but you know that's kind of like a cheap adjunct that sometimes works in some styles like pilsner uh, like a, if you're trying to make like an american style pilsner or something but generally i don't make styles like that i certainly i can't make a lager here i can't make a lager that's any good anyway or i would do it because you know, people ask me to make lagers, and I'm like, ah, yeah. if I could make a good lager in this little brewery with a short period of time that I have, I would, but I can't. So I try to just make beers that I, I know I can make well. Right. Yeah. And the process is, is pretty much the same for all the beers. It's just what ingredients you're adding that change color, flavor for the most profile. Part, yeah, the process is almost exactly the same. Yeah. And the amount and of the, hops. The recipe changes. The type of hops. And the process. I'm a process guy. I'm a technician, remember? And I'm a process guy, and I'm all about the process and the precision of the process. I want the process to be the same all the time. I train my staff, the guys that help me, I train them, guys and gals that help me, I train them to do, we all have to do everything exactly the same way every time. The process is so important, and, and a lot of people don't understand that about uh, making food products for people. It's the process that matters. The, the recipe is important, but the recipe is the easy part. You know, it's the process and, and really nailing that process the same every time is, and, and then putting the same ingredients and the beer is going to taste the same every time. And I think Super it's your, important. And I think it's your enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate... I got a little of that. I, I, <laughs> I really appreciate your time. All right. Right, and, the, and all of the great information about how this is yeah. done. And it, it, it goes with everything that you're doing here, with yeah. the food and everything else. And obviously people are, are enjoying it. Yeah. So Super nice to meet you, Dan. Thank you, you, you so you much too, for Black coming Black. in. Thank you so much. We'll have to drink a beer again sometime. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, you guys. Belmont Brewing Company. Come on Come down. Come back.